I want to know what the sort of inciting incident in your life was. I know there was a moment where you thought maybe you were going to be a lawyer. You're one of the most brilliant humans that I know. Tell me what made you decide to go to rabbinical school? What happened in your Mm. life that made you want to be a rabbi? Oh, I, yeah, I grew up um, a secular Jew, um, though strongly identified with my Jewish, um, my Jewish roots, but very disconnected from Jewish religious practice. And I ended up through a series of humiliating experiences when I would walk into Jewish environments. Um, Once I went to college, I just felt like I was the person who knew nothing. And I was embarrassed again and again and again. I always, you know, sat down when everyone was standing up. I spoke when you're supposed to be silent. I mean, I just did everything wrong. And I felt so embarrassed. This is my tradition. This is my my great, great, great grandparents were practicing this. And I don't even know enough to know what they rejected. And so I started going on this journey to discover my roots and just find a place where I could start to ask questions. And because I was in New York City at the time in college, there were lots of options. (laughs) And I went, I went with the, you know, the cute boy across the hall who turned out to be my husband years later. Um, (laughs) We went to, we got a list of synagogues in New York City. We went to every single synagogue um, that we, one by one by one. And I walked out of all of them crying because nobody said hello when we walked in. Nobody told me what page we were on. Nobody, you know, well, made us feel like we were welcome in this place. I just felt like I'm an intruder on my own family. I don't fit in even in my own home. And then finally, but then we would go out to dinner and have a glass of wine and talk about it and fall in love. And so eventually, it's this part of our falling in love montage. So at some point, I ended up at a synagogue on the Upper West Side called B'nai Jeshurun. That you um, that you know of, and I walked in, and the rabbis were talking. Uh, this was in the early '90s about HIV/AIDS and how it was a moral imperative that we, as Jews and as human beings, spoke honestly and with moral clarity about what was happening and about the way that hatred and cruelty were contributing to the perpetuation of a disease that would become a global um, pandemic. And that if we didn't do something immediately, that tens of millions of people around the world were going to die. And I I turned to David sitting next to me and I said, oh my God, that's what it means to be a Jew. We have responsibilities to other human beings. We have to be truthful. We have to be just, we have to be brave. That's what it means. And then they started to sing and everyone rose to their feet and just started dancing. And I thought, oh my God, it's not just honest and brave and courageous. It's beautiful and joyous. And that's what I want in my life. So the next semester I went to Israel, I went to go study in Jerusalem because I thought I'm completely functionally illiterate as a Jew. I don't know, I don't know anything and I want to learn. And I kind of immersed myself in this environment in Jerusalem where I could just drink in everything. And try to understand how this fit into my life. I was still fully intending to become a civil rights attorney at this point. And then I had one crazy Shabbat, one one weekend in the old city in Jerusalem. And I actually had this realization that the great agents of social change, the people who I admired most and who actually had inspired me to want to become a civil rights attorney and had made me into an activist, a justice, you know, activist, were people who had faith meant most of them if not all of them were people who had a core story and i realized that some of their stories were also my story in other words dr king was so motivated by and mobilized by the story of the exodus from egypt and that story is also my story and i i had this epiphany and i thought oh my god i'm going to become a rabbi and it, it had, I mean, it was like a bolt of lightning moment. And I, I mean, literally went and called my, my parents after this m- moment. And I said, I'm going to be a rabbi. And they're like, what are you talking about? You're going to law school. And so, and, Put and my Sharon mom, on the phone, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> Who took my child? So exactly. they, and then they, you know, and literally my mom said, I thought you said you were going to do something good for the world. So, and, and by the way, immediately afterwards, they were totally on board, like the most supportive sitting in the front row, you know, wonderful. But at the time they were like, what are you, what do you mean? 
And I realized that part of what I needed to do was translate these ancient stories, which survived in this world for a reason, into a discourse of social transformation for our time. And that that path was a Jew, what my path was a Jewish path, but the people who are most closely my partners in this work were actually weren't Jews. They were people from other faith traditions who similarly found the impetus for social change, the impetus for our work in building a just and loving world from their own traditions, from their own sacred narratives. And for me, that was a really transformative part of the journey. And, and so I've always, from the beginning, been looking for, you know, who are the partners? Who are the allies? Where, is the, where are the people who are driven by ancient core narratives to build a world transformed, a world of love and a world of justice? And I'm so inspired by that. And by the way, along the way, lots of partners who don't have ancient stories and narratives, but also share the dream of a world in which people take care of each other and are gentle with one another and tender and loving. And that I believe is the world that we have to continue to lift our gaze to see because it's so hard in this moment when people are so cruel to each other. And especially when religious traditions are at the heart of so much of that cruelty to really offer a radically different view and to say, this is also a legitimate authentic expression of this very ancient story. And this story really is about love and dignity and justice. This story is about recognizing that every single person is created in God's own image and therefore deserves to live in dignity. And there's a, there's a little um, story that I share in chapter three of the book. Um, this is a text that I first heard from one of my friends, a great teacher, Rabbi Shai Held. Um, some, I don't know, 20 years ago, he shared this story from our tradition that Every person, this, this is like 1600 years old. Every person, wherever we go, is surrounded by a procession of angels singing and blowing the shofar and saying, make way for an image of the Holy One is approaching. And it's just like, I just beg us to imagine what would it mean to go to, you know, to, to the market, to walk down the street, and imagine that every single person who's warming themselves on the, you know, on the steam from the, you know, from the subway is created in the image of God, is surrounded by a procession of angels blowing horns saying, hey, wake up, people. This is an image of the Holy One. And what would it mean if we engaged each other in that way? And when somebody's hurting, and the last thing I want to do is be close to your pain because it reminds me that I am also vulnerable and could also experience pain, instead to hear the shofar to hear the horn and to hear the angels and to say, my God, this is an image of the Holy One too. So how can I engage this person with love because she deserves it just like I do?